All right, let's go to part two of chapter 13. And let's talk a little bit about preschool classrooms. Um, an article by Watson, Layton, Pearson, Abraham described a preschool program for children with language disorders that incorporated instruction in emerging literacy skills into activities that most teachers um, would be really familiar with. Circle time, story time, story related group activity, literary, literacy rich centers, so art and writing, role playing, even in snack time, um, gross motor play, outdoor activities, closing circle. So <clears throat> incorporating stories, incorporating reading, looking at books, talking about books, talking about words, talking about sounds, doing all of these things. Ostrowski and Kaiser suggested seven strategies to increase communication opportunities for children and to increase the likelihood that the teacher, the adult, will prompt the use of language. So number one, I mean, some of these are fairly obvious, but using interesting materials, providing materials and activities that children enjoy, preferences can be identified through observation during free play time and activities. Number two, placing items out of reach. So place some desired items in view, but out of reach in order to prompt requests by the children. So, and we're talking about preschool classrooms, but you know, as the speech therapist, we can come in, we can help the um, preschool teachers do this. And if we're doing pullout, we can do a lot of these things. I mean, these are things that SLPs do all the time. Um, Number three, kind of related to number two, providing inadequate portions. So provide children with small or inadequate portions of material, such as blocks or, or paper or whatever. You know, so having an activity where they obviously need more things, not giving them all the things, making children ask for things um, and have an interaction. Number four, giving children opportunities for choice making. Um, children can be prompted to make a choice by being presented with two objects and asked to make a choice between the two. Providing assistance. So again, creating a situation in which the children will need assistance um, from either their peers or from grown-ups. A wind-up toy or an, an unopened bottle of bubbles may provide opportunities for children to request adult assistance. Oh, sorry, using sabotage. A sabotage is created when children are not provided with all the materials they need to complete a task, right? Kind of like one before that we talked about. So students may be asked to cut out pictures and paste them on a chart, but are given no paste or, or maybe are given just a piece of paper and they're asked to cut with scissors and, and, and then paste it. Um, you know, it forces kids to then ask for things. Um, right? And these can be useful either um, with kids who have a language disorder or grouping kids who have a language disorder with kids who don't so that their, you know, regular age peers can, um, can model how to ask for things, um, how to, you know, ask for assistance. So that can be helpful too. Use of silly situations. So children may be prompted to communicate by creating silly or absurd situations or, you know, the teacher doing silly or absurd things, holding pictures upside down, um, missing some dates on the calendar so that the kids have to count and figure out which numbers are missing. Um, you know, just so like making mistakes is a great way to teach language. As kids get older in elementary school, the focus is on developing oral and written language skills, especially phonological processing and reading. Many reading programs are going to include activities to develop phonological skills, but many students need more of this, more practice on these skills than is generally provided. Teachers can provide assistance by helping students practice with phonological processing tasks paying attention to rhyme, practicing dividing words into parts, putting the parts back together to make words, right? So what, what sounds do you hear in cats, right? K -a -t. And then giving, all right, here's a word, d -a -g. what word is that, right? 
Other language skills are important for reading and writing, like vocabulary, grammatical knowledge, and narrative skills or storytelling, um, which is an aspect of pragmatic language, right? So all of this, all of these things um, are going to be helpful for reading and writing, not just the phonological parts. Um, presentation of information also helps language learners. Um, the optimal pace varies from learner to learner. Um, the pace of a lesson matters and educators should find the right pace for their classroom, right? They could even group the kids up into you know, kids with sort of higher level language skills, kids with lower level language skills. Um, the teacher or the speech therapist introduces an activity and has them do it. You know, so you, you do sort of a quick introduction first, have the kids with the higher language skills, then work on that. And then, you know, keep talking to the group um, that needs more information, a slower piece, a slower pace, right? Give them more information about what to do. Um, and then have them start the task. So slowing things down a little bit, giving them more time, giving them more information can be really helpful. Um, an instructional approach that has been used with success with secondary age students is learning strategies. Many students lack an efficient strategy when encountering unknown words. So the dissect strategy by Lentz and Hughes helps secondary students decode words. D, discover the context. I, isolate the prefix. S, separate the suffix. S, say the stem of the word. E, examine the stem. C, check with someone. T, try the dictionary, right? That's a lot. That's a lot of steps, right? I'd be worried that if we had a, a kid with a language disorder, that's too many steps. Um, Continue, well, continued development of semantic skills, especially vocabulary, is also essential for academic success. Language is an essential part of social competence. Teachers can support the development of social interaction skills by providing opportunities for interacting with a variety of communicative partners during different activities. Based language instruction for students with significant disabilities is similar to instruction for other students in many ways. Um, we want to use naturally occurring opportunities throughout the school day to model and teach language skills, using peers to promote language from students with significant disabilities, systematic instruction on specific language structures, right? So really focusing on specific tasks, um, specific instruction and phonological awareness, um, really working on that um, really obviously and systematically um, working on phonological awareness skills. In other ways, however, language instruction may be different. Um, there might be an AAC system in place, um, augmentative or alternative communication. So that could be that could be pictures, that could be, you know, speech software, that could be um, computers. There may need to be more intensive instruction in order to achieve skill objectives. So instruction that's delivered more frequently with more examples, more opportunities for practice. So really, really working on the basic skills, the foundational skills, um, you know, to get them ready to really succeed. Principles for teaching language and communication skills to students with significant disabilities. Um, using typical development as a framework for instruction. Um, children with significant disabilities don't always follow the typical developmental sequence. A lot of them will. Um, and typical development can still be a good guide for planning an instructional sequence, right? So we already know we have a developmental sequence going, right? Where are the kids that we're working with? What's the next step? What's the next logical thing that they would learn or be able to do, and let's teach that. Um, and again, teaching functional skills. It's possible and preferable to teach developmental skills in functional ways. So meaningful skills, functional skills, rather than just drilling on things that aren't important.
Develop clear and measurable objectives. Progress is often slow and in small increments for this population. If objectives are carefully written, it's possible to measure success and know when it's time to move ahead. So, um, you know, lots of times, again, things, things are slow, but you can have moments of real clarity for these kids and it can be exciting when these make when they make these leaps but you know really planning out ahead of time what you're going to do how you're going to do it and um you know what goals we're trying to meet is going to make a big difference consider the students sensory strengths and weaknesses so some students with significant disabilities have sensory disabilities that make it difficult for them to learn through listening or seeing or other um, means so really thinking about what's the best way to teach these kids using age-appropriate methods and materials although it's not always easy to find appropriate materials for students um, it's important to try to find or create such materials so trying to use age-appropriate things you know um, materials reading or something else but that is just geared down to their level. So it's still talking about topics that, you know, a 13 or 14 year old are interested in, but yet we might be teaching a skill that, you know, uh, we'd be teaching to a four or five year old. So it's really important to try to, you know, gear what we're doing to our students, which, which we know, right? Um, we want to increase the intensity of instruction is going to lead to significant improvements, right? The more you do something, the better you're going to get at it. So um, you could do fast paced lessons. Activities focusing on letter sounds and words can be very short, ranging from one to five minutes, but doing it every day, right? Every day, every day, every day. Um, moving quickly from one activity to the next so kids don't get too bored. I mean, you know, it's hard because we also talked about, you know, when we're giving directions, when we're giving instruction, we want to slow that down. But then when it's time for them to work, keeping things moving can be really helpful. So using appropriate pacing, pacing within activities was as quick as possible while allowing students adequate processing time promote automaticity so teachers gradually reduced processing time until students responses became quick and automatic right so start out giving them lots of time see if they can do it just more automatically as they go using behavioral management techniques to decrease time off task teachers developed routine prompts to quickly remind students to stay on task and they reinforced on task behavior spend less time on clearly mastered skills allow more practice time for skills that are not mastered obviously right most children are going to acquire the essential elements of their first language without direct instruction because they're hearing it all the time um, but when children come to school they're expected to identify the elements of language in order to develop literacy right so all the skills that we've been talking about, the phonological awareness skills, all of that. Because of this, teachers and other school professionals may want to help children develop their knowledge of the elements of language. Instruction can be delivered in whole class lessons to all students, which would be tier one, or to individuals in small groups who have been identified as needing targeted, targeted instruction, tier two. All right, let's get a little more specific. So teaching specific language skills, phonology. Phonological awareness training um, enhances the phonological skills, right? Phoneme segmentation, phoneme blending, um, syllables, all that stuff that we've talked about. There are numerous apps available now that are designed to help children develop their phonological and phonemic skills. Um, so Florida Assessments for Instruction in Reading has Artic Picks, Articulate It, um, Speech Trainer 3, Say It Again, Speech Stickers, ABC Phonics Rhyming. So check some of these out and look at them. All right, let's talk about morphology. Kirby and Bauer suggested instructional practices for teaching morphology. Having your kids be the word detective. 
um, have them search for examples of word patterns, such as the addition of ing ending in their um, in their class textbooks. Right, searching for ing, ed, plural s, um, things like that. Word sums and word matrices present words that may be related by a base, such as interrupt, corrupt. Um, so identify the common base and test the hypothesis using the word sum. So it's inter plus rupt, core plus rupt. Um, construct a word matrix around this base. Again, just getting kids familiar with, um, you know, words and the how words are made up and spelled and how you read them and say them. Syntax. Eisenberg identified several evidence-based practices for teaching syntactic skills based on research. So explicit instruction, so just drill and practice on the specific skills. Imitation, presenting the child with sentences in the correct form and having them repeat and imitate the sentence. Partial imitation, presenting a model from one source and then asking the child to describe a similar picture um, where they would use the same, um, the same syntactic structure. Modeling, the child listens to a set of models while looking at the pictures before being asked to talk about the same set of pictures, right? So here are some um, model sentences. Um, and then after a second, the child's asked to then talk about it and hopefully using the same types of sentences. Corrected practice, prompting the child with a stimulus such as a picture or a sentence fragment, like showing a picture of a horse and a rider. Look at the girl. What do you think she's going to do? Um, and then if the child makes a, an error, the instructor is going to model the correct form and ask the child to re repeat the correct form. Playing the WH20 questions game, the teacher shows the group a bag containing an object. The students must then guess what the object is, that should be ob what the object is, by using WH questions. So what, where, who, and why. Um, Mad Libs are good for this, right? Have students dictate or write, depending on their skill, a story. Then the teacher can blank out certain words, all the nouns, all the pronouns, all the verbs, um, and have them play Mad Libs. All right. Semantics. Several methods for improving the vocabulary knowledge of students with vocabulary learning difficulties, including mnemonic strategies, which we talked about in a previous chapter, right? Looking at the keyword method. So what's the keyword? What does that make you think of? Um, can you make a, a rhyme with it? Also semantic mapping, right? Looking at relationships. What's the keyword? What's the main thing connected to? What kind of class of things is it? So the keyword method uses a three-step process to aid the learner in vocabulary. The target word, um, so fort, is recorded into a word that the student already knows that is acoustically similar to the target. Um, so such as fort, right? An interactive picture is created that contains an action related to the key word to illustrate the meaning of the target word. Um, there'd be a picture of a fort with guns. Um, the guns were loud. The student is prompted to state the meaning of the target word that fort means loud using the keyword fort, the action depicted, and the description. Oh, we've got oh, the word mapping strategy used by Harris and colleagues has four steps. You want to break words into their morphemic parts, prefix, suffix, root, attach meaning to each word part, make a prediction about the meaning of the unknown word based on the meaning of the parts, and then check the dictionary for the definition. All right, now pragmatics. All students need to have effective communication skills in order to interact with their peers, work in groups, participate in classroom interaction, and negotiate and resolve conflicts with their peers. 
Um, all right, so here are three different methods for doing this. Goldstein, Schneider, and, and Thyman identified three methods for teaching pragmatic language skills. All right, one is a peer-mediated method. Uses, uses peers to engage children who are having difficulty with social, communicative interactions. An essential aspect involves teaching the peer how to effectively engage their partner in conversation, right? So this is really teaching the peer. Sociodramatic script model, often called social scripts. Um, this is where students are pre-taught language for specific situation. This can involve conversation starters, responses, ideas to connect conversations, or to change the topic. And then we've got text and graphic cueing. Social stories or narratives contain four types of sentences. Descriptive, prescriptive, directive, which tells students what to do, and control. After the story is read, the student writes sentences to help them remember the information. 